Um, I have a question for Professor Hoppe, but of course for the whole panel if someone wants to expand. I think the, the best uh, example for a, um, a Haller example of society was the um, old Roman society, which was a collection of families. And um, the relationship between the different pater familias of the different families were similar to international law. So each family was viewed as, a, as an independent kind of, uh, of, of uh, social cell. And uh, this kind of society gave rise to probably the most important system of law which we we'll still use today. So maybe this is a historical proof that Haller was right in his analysis. Let me just say, I, I didn't get into some, some of his work, and Tyler's work is very extensive. Uh, he does criticize Roman law. I think there are also certain mistakes that uh, exist in Roman law, but, but I didn't investigate precisely his criticism of Roman law. He sees certain similarities, I must say, but uh, maybe, maybe that would be a task for you because he is, uh, he is also translated into Italian, as far as I know. Um, he had also quite a few number of students in the 19th in the 19th century in in Spain in Spain he wrote for instance a, a vehement attack on the institution of the Cortes in in Spain and he he does have various sections where where he explains what is wrong with Roman law so maybe I assign you to this task for the next time <laughs> Um, right, right to this um, law connection, uh, law subject. Uh, first of all, I, I look very much forward to read um, Hollow. I, I didn't know, at least not in detail, just the name, and uh, that, that will certainly be interesting also for lawyers, I think. It reminded me of what you was, were, were telling us, reminded me to another author, a contemporary author, also one of the old regime, so to speak, but with a very truly liberal attitude, um, Savigny. Um, the, 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 the famous founder of the historical school of law, who maybe more toward Roman law, but mainly he looked at law as a phenomenon that developed um, certain rule that came up out or came out of a decentralized order. It 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 uh, um, came up out of the conflicts that had to be solved by by judges and so on, and and then he described what was the law. He did not propose what should be the law, he described what is the law. So uh, in a way, a uh, natural law, not in the technical sense, but uh, um, a view that looks at reality and tries to understand what is there. And maybe it's, it's comparable, at least what Haller said. In a way, since I'm not a lawyer and uh, I know very little about the, the the, the history of law. Um, my purpose was, in a way, uh, to get lawyers interested in in his work, and and I see what you just said that I, I never really heard much about Haller. Yeah, you have heard his name or something like that. No, but the guy is considered an outcast nowadays, and I want to raise interest and. Uh, and appeal to people also speaking other languages to look at his work in, in the various translations. Not all of his works have been translated, but many of them have been translated. And I think there, that is uh, a source of great wisdom that we libertarians can find in his work. My question is for uh, David Durr. Uh, you spoke about uh, state as an evolutionary uh, uh, mishap. But I wonder that, could it be that in a situation where uh, humanity went to 
agriculture and you could have crop failures and that could result in famines, that an attitude would arise where uh, a lot of people uh, sacrifice themselves for the leader in order to uh, get them through the bottleneck of the famine. So the leader survives the famine because they sacrifice their resources to the leader. Could, it, could that uh, be a, an evolutionary explanation for the state? So, um, if, if I understood your, your question correctly, um, I, I would say, or what, what seems um, at least plausible to me is that, um, you know, you had just external circumstances that um, the, the den, den, density, can, can we say that? So, so the population is, is more dense than it was before because more people on a, on a certain, in a certain territory, uh, more cooperation, more separation of different functions of labor, so more, a more sophisticated system. Um, but still, but still um, a, a, a species that um, essentially functions from the individual. Um, and, and then what changed to a structures which, which I call an error is that this self-related position that was developed in a long evolution and that proved to be successful and useful in everyday life, that this became a other object, so to speak, that at least certain, certain people had then the attitude to decide for themselves, but not only what their activity is concerned, but also what other activities is concerned. And, and of course, on the other side, there were people that maybe accepted, that they maybe in the first instance, to a certain extent, they accepted it, but um, I would say not all, at least, and uh, um, maybe it, it switched from acceptance by individual um, individuals, by free will, by yeah, um, to um, subordination, and I think that um, that then led to this structure of. Uh, um, of, of these power concentrations. I would say par parallel to that, um, there were useful evolutions as well. For instance, out of this agricultural density, there was, it became, it, it became necessary to define borders and to develop property to articulate property and to say, um, look, um, now it's it's not like in earlier times when when they they you know they um, went around for new hunting and and um, gathering places that now we are here. So it's necessary to find useful borders, which is nothing but property. You know, so uh, sometimes you hear that maybe in, in rather leftist theories, that that was the fall of man, sedentariness, that's where this evil property came up, you know. And I would say property, that was a useful um, uh, um, behavior, a useful aspect, maybe a useful correction of certain tensions, um, while that other evolution, that to it, um, power concentration, that was the, the bad side of it. Did, did I understand your question, or was it an answer to your question? I mean... <laughs> no. One thing is, of course, as soon as societies become sedentary and accumulate more goods, um, uh, 
what comes into existence is uh, systematic stealing also, which if, if people just simply roam around, um, they might kill each other or something like this. But systematic robbery requires, of course, accumulation of wealth, and that only comes about once people become settled. But the problem of, okay, bad harvest or something like this, that doesn't require a state. Just a, a, a private entrepreneurs, the, the type of king or prince that I described there can do that just as well. And you attach yourself to those people because, you know, they are smarter, they know more, they accumulate things, they, have more, they are more far-sighted, and because of this, I try to be his friend. Uh, Nothing, n nothing that the state has to follow from it. It can follow from it, but there is no necessity um, that out of these types of problems, whatever, high water or bad harvest would, would uh, automatically lead to some sort of m monopoly, monopoly justice. Uh, entrepreneurs nowadays also just deal with the problem of hurricanes and things like and things like that and we know that they are usually better handling it than the state is doing it. Yes, maybe not exactly what I what I meant because yeah, of course the state will deal with all these disasters very badly, but I was thinking more that if you have a famine and there's only food for normally there's food for 100 people when you have 100 people and there's a famine a crop failure and you have only food for 10 people to survive that an an attitude would arise or a morality would arise where where people start to sacrifice themselves to have to choose these 10 survivors but it's, it's a difficult to explain maybe i can do it later with a bit, bit more uh, words Uh, my question goes to Professor Hoppe. First of all, thank you for this very in uh, interesting uh, lecture and that you have introduced Halla to us. My question would be, uh, did Halla directly uh, discuss Hobbes, Jean Baudin, and other uh, uh, state theorists of, of uh, the 60, 60s and 70th century? What? Did he discuss Hobbes and he did, Jean he did dis he discussed all, He discussed all of them, yet, but I, I, I did not, again, I, it would have taken a few more hours to go over all of this. Yes, he discussed each, each of them and also many, many people that are nowadays almost unknown. Uh, but yes, he has, he has some... Uh, 10, 20 pages on, on Hobbes, he has pages on, on Locke, on Montesquieu. I, he, I can only give you uh, the flavor of it by saying uh, Montes, Montesquieu is a complete, a complete idiot in his, his view. Rousseau is a nut. Um, Hugo Grotius is c quite good. And then from there, everything goes down the drain. One, one gets worse than the other. He discusses all of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, did uh, Kunert Ledin uh, quote him? Uh, Kunert Ledin only mentions him in a footnote. Um, but I never, I don't remember that Kunert Ledin discussed him in any detail. He, he would uh, count him among those people that he likes, but he doesn't say exactly why and to what extent he agrees with him. He mentions him, however, okay. yeah. Oh, you know, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Mont Montesquieu, all, all, in his view, all nuts, all sophists and so forth. This is a question for Herr Model. Uh, I would like to know of all the countries that you run your companies in, uh, which one of those give you the least amount of bu bureaucratic hell and which one gives you the most amount of bureaucratic hell? And especially I would like to know if uh, Liechtenstein, for example, does it have less red tape than, uh, for example, Switzerland?
Yes, we are active in six countries. So if I'd make um, a row, um, it's, it's a bit difficult. Uh, Liechtenstein has given us the biggest relief in our personal life, so to speak. So that such a thing uh, exists where you can go to exile and feel better than f uh, coming from your home country is, of course, like a bias in a way, because uh, it can be the case for many people, you know, that the, the law is, is really ridiculous there. So, for example, if a German comes to Switzerland, he can, in some cantons, ask for a flat tax. Uh, so we know that Liechtenstein people leave Liechtenstein to live in Switzerland on the basis of a flat tax and of course Swiss people go to Liechtenstein to have the same privilege as an exiled person, uh, which is of course also a matter of humor that, that these exchanges actually give, like Ricardo said, uh, mutual benefits. So the good is not exchange between the people, the people, the person itself is the good who changes the places. So, uh, but basically the Liechtenstein is of course a great place uh, because the, the tax situation, not only on the personal level, is, is uh, very positive, but on the legal uh, level, the, the legal entity, you must know that in Liechtenstein, a so-called um, Beteiligungsertrag, which in English would be something like a, a, a dividend out of uh, participation, if then you paid out in the last instance to the natural person, this dividend is taxed zero, which in a way is only logic because the dividend of a participation already was taxed, otherwise it would not be a dividend. Now, uh, in Switzerland, they really did a ridiculous thing. Uh, again, were of war. They declared holdings uh, as privileged taxed entities. So that was just the wording, and with this, uh, and this notion of equality, uh, the political power could actually um, bring through that privileges are something bad and we have to abolish privileges. So in Switzerland, starting from this year, as far as I know, holdings are taxed equally as normal companies. All the holdings, of course, have their income from already taxed profits of, of participations. So uh, you see, Switzerland has fallen into that trap. So certainly leaves behind Liechtenstein, and Liechtenstein did not change the, the taxation of holding companies. So a, a very good place there. Then I would say Poland comes quite early after that. At the moment, I have no knowledge of really basic bad things happening in bureaucracy unless one thing they do not accept at the moment our um, fee that we are asking uh, for our uh, central services in Switzerland. So like for example, the usage of a logo uh, contains a lot of uh, reputation of a company and this has a value and we say we have some marketing uh, uh, efforts and please uh, give us 2% of sales. Poland at the moment is the strictest country who does not allow 2% of sales. At the moment their, uh, their suggestion is 0.5. So, which is ridiculous by the way. Um, 
at the moment, if you look to Europe in, in terms of such issues, it's really nice that Europe is still alive because the diversity is huge. In every country, EU, yes or no, you have a different ways or level what they accept on, on uh, tax questions. But Poland is, is in terms of labor law is, is quite, quite amazing uh, liberal. Then I would say comes uh, Czech Republic and Croatia. Czech Republic has a little bit of trade union issues, uh, which is uh, strange in a way. Uh, we do not understand how it came into it. Then on the fourth position or last position uh, at the moment is, is Germany in, in my country, uh, my company, which is my country, yes. Uh, Maybe a remark, there is on purpose, of course, some countries lacking in our organization. And first of all, I would mention still France. It is an absolute no-go for us uh, since 30 years to invest into France. Sorry, sorry to say like that, but it's... Uh, and I would, I would still, to France is a phenomenon. There are people who are successful in France. For me, it was always... Uh, a wonder, and most of them are French people, and they know how to do it, and I admire that, and I have to respect that, but certainly these are the limits of globalizations. Uh, we are, sorry to say, uh, not in Italy. Uh, maybe you noticed my question to Alessandro yesterday, that I would love to understand Italy, because I don't. Uh, and so it's very dangerous to invest into a country that you don't understand. France belongs to that. And uh, I can still select my favorite countries. And this selection is exactly these fives I have chosen. So um, this is a bit of a complicated question because like, formulating itself, for, formulating the question itself uh, is tough. but. We probably should talk about that. Um, we've seen an enormous amount of fear and terror that people have been subjected to over the past decades, you know, coming from things like climate change and you know inequality and now COVID and everything that are being used to ratchet up the level of oppression and to re diminish and substantially just cancel at this point cancel basic human rights that would be understood as given just 30 years ago. Coming from international organizations like uh, the World Trade Organization, the World Economic Forum, and these are all supranational organizations that sadly some of them have, you know, they reside in Switzerland. I, that, I'm still in shock at that. What should be done to make sure that their efforts at re-feudalizing the world are failures. What can we do? And this is a question just for the general panel because I'm actually interested in multiple perspectives on this. Thanks. Just, just to be clear, the question, the, the one sentence question is, what can we do to make sure that the influence of these organizations and the campaign of terror used to take away our freedoms reduces to, to bring back freedom and prevent these organizations from continuing to take away people's freedoms and rights and, and livelihoods? I have to ex uh, say that I'm still not quite sure what the question is, uh, but if, if it is just simply the, the how, how can we uh, restore normality to society, something like that, um, I, I would say, again, we have, to, we have to increase competition between different regions in order to figure out uh, which system works better and which doesn't and allow people to move from one place 
from those places that are less successful to those places that are more successful. Um, so we have to, you are right at the, at the current moment there still exist some differences between Poland and the Czech Republic and, and Switzerland and, and Germany and, and France. I agree with France has the most terrible labor laws that you can, can imagine. You would never open a company because you can never get rid of your employees. Um, and in other places that is uh, easier, but th the entire purpose of the European Union is of course to get rid of this. Um, they, they want to harmonize everything um, and of course harmonize it uh, upward. I mean there were the complaints about what was years ago that the Germans complained about Luxembourg, which is also a member of the European Union, uh, charging lower taxes than, than Germany does. Um, uh, and, and I thought that was unfair. No, no, nobody in the German press said, I mean, you are free to do it just like Luxembourg. Uh, you can also lower your taxes and uh, then there is no complaint anymore. Um, so the harmonization that is promoted by the EU is always upward harmonization. If you have that tax and you have that tax, uh, then the European Union want that both countries have the same, the same sort of tax. This is the, one of the advantages it, still of S Switzerland and, and Liechtenstein that they are not part of the European Union. And the European Union is of course exercising tremendous pressure on both of these places to also adhere to uh, their own more ridiculous policies than they do in Switzerland and in Liechtenstein, but you can see if you follow uh, policies in, uh, in Switzerland, this, this is the same, the same tendency of concentrating power more and more on the, in the central government and taking power away from the cantons, which currently are still competing to a certain extent with each other. So the, the, the European Union has to be condemned. That is just the most ridiculous institution that one can imagine. And people tell you always in, in Germany, oh, how much we gained from the European Union uh, as if Germany uh, be, became uh, richer, become, uh, being a member of the European Union. The Germans were compared to other countries far wealthier and the difference between Germany and other and the poorer countries had, had, has become smaller and smaller. So competition is the, the only way to return to a normality. Maybe I didn't answer exactly what you wanted. Well, in a way, this question comes up every year. I mean, when the PFS happens, and I would, I would try to to answer as practical as possible. So, uh, do not fall in, into the trap of collectivism. Because your answer in a, uh, your question is, is direct and what could we do and, and the we is already a trap. Because look at this audience now, we are coming from different places, we are in def different functions, we, are, we have different obligations. So if everybody of us is going home tomorrow and everybody is doing in Italy what, what you are doing already uh, as entrepreneur, as philosopher, as lawyer, and, and uh, try to be as natural as possible. So not enforce something, oh, I have a rebellious mind and now I'm making a rebellion. They all fail because you cannot, uh, let's say, master your temperament. You have to master First of all, yourself. That's probably my first advice. Do not get lost out of uh, all these heaps of criticism that we, that we aggregate every time we have such conferences. So master yourself and be a person, a decent person, as we heard from, from Hans Hoppe and Mr. von Haller, you are a father of a family, you have educational uh, tasks, you have kids, 
You can do a lot in your surrounding. I, I am now, as you heard today, in a position where I start to make opposition, not because I, I like to, to make op opposition, but because the stupidity has come to a, a degree where you have to do it in order to protect yourself and your soul who is living in your body and who would oppose to you and give you probably illness if you would not oppose to that stupidity where healthy people have to prove themselves every other day and if not you are uh, symptomless ill that was used healthy before now you are symptomless ill now, you have to stop that stupidity to protect yourself. And I think this is the best motivation to, to be moderate. I, I liked this also, this mentioning of these bourgeois uh, virtues. Moderation is probably one of the most difficult things. So stay moderate, say this is the, the limit. Here you can come and not any further because I have to protect me and my health and my mental health. So for example, in my case, I had to exclamate my state Avalon, not because of a revolutionary mood. It was an intellectual necessity when I compared my company where I was trying to keep my headquarter low and, you know, uh, was growing and the state is not growing uh, in the sense of inhabitants but is growing in the sense of bureaucracy, I simply had to, I had to take the conclusion I cannot continue with you guys because you are insane. So I thought that was always a natural thing to do. So please do natural thing. Listen to your body, listen to your spirit, and he will or it will tell you what you do, but not your temperaments. Well, that, that, that was a good answer. I could add um, some additional thoughts to that subject. If I under stand your question correctly. So it's what, what shall we do, what can we do in order to, to get out of this, this uh, crazy system, statist system, that was in a core your question. Now, um, I usually think of two aspects of this. One is that I think the problem is that big that it's maybe too big in order to be subject of a you know specific political program we decide now to do this and then we implement it um, it's I think it's on a, on a too fundamental and um, and maybe high level um, in, in order to just just uh, make a project out of it and try to, to change it. Um, it has to do with these long-term evolutions I, I um, showed in my presentation. And um, I think the general attitude or a, a fitting attitude could be to look at everything in this respect as a phenom phenomenon. It's an astonishing phenomenon perhaps that that we have these structures, but once you take a little bit more distance, so the uh, the Google Earth view, you know, on, on this, this thing, also in, in terms of time, time arrow, then one, 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 I can really say that this statist um, structure is perhaps really something relatively new. It's not an old tradition. It's not something that corresponds to Homo sapiens. It's something strange in a way. It's something that presumably will not survive very long. Um, if everybody says, but look, look at society, everybody wants a state. 
um, you are some extremists, 90% percent want a state, then, then I would say and I would think, okay, it might be currently that's the case, but which is also the case that some very few think differently. This also is a phenomenon. I mean, the evolution of man, of society, um, also produces this kind of thinking. We too are part of that evolution and there are some inbuilt corrections maybe that gave us hope that they will prevail on the long, on the long run. That, that would be one answer to that, maybe a, a, a bit abstract, <laughs> I admit, but nevertheless. And the second one is um, beside activities, and it's really good to, to have activities precisely, precise, concrete activities. Beside that, I think telling these things, um, you know, um, making um, speeches, uh, writing um, books, and, and so on. So speaking about that, trying to convince other people, I think that, that's a, a big part of it. And what that is concerned, I think what is very important, that that's my view and the view of many here, but maybe not of all, what is very important is to be radical, really radical in this respect, and not to say we have to reduce the state. Of course we do have to reduce it, but that's just a symptom. Um, to reduce the state, um, I mean, it's not possible, I would say, but even if with some you know, efforts you can um, achieve some reduction, you still did not touch the real problem. You just made a symptom treatment, but the cause of it is the state as such. As long as you do have a state, and be it a small state, you did not yet take the problem in hands. And I think in, in discussing, in presenting um, aspects of this, this subject, it's, I would say it's very important to say that the state is the problem. As long as you did not abolish or um, yeah, this, this institution, you won't solve these problems. So that, that would be my, my uh, ideas to, to that, to that uh, question. My question is for Stefan and uh, David as my fellow colleagues and attorneys as well. I think what we can take as a balance of the last uh, 18, 19 months is the failure of constitutions. Uh, whatever rights are written in the constitutions, the states uh, ran roughshod on them. So uh, as, as an idea, thinking that probably we won't do without states and without constitutions for a long time uh, because it's unlikely that we will be joined by many people as much as, me tr as we try. Uh, I think the main issue in constitutions is that they don't have an opt-out clause, clause. You cannot opt out of the state. It's a structure which is there to remain and in order to make this uh, um, more likely to be accepted, they say yes, but you have lots of rights and uh, we have a whole catalog of rights you have. I think we should go to private law as usual, which is a very good example to solve problems. And uh, in any collective private law enterprise, you, have, you usually have an opt-out clause. You can opt out of companies, you can sell your shares, or you can uh, force the shareholders to buy them, depending on how the the contract is made up. You can opt out of homeowners associations, at least in part. For example, you can refuse central heating and say, I, I do my own heating, I don't, don't want to, to um, buy your heating. This should be a model for future constitution, not so much how they structure the state, as you mentioned, Stefan, but how it is possible to get out of the state maybe on, on the lines of a soft secession, not completely, but at least part out of the state, and then be transformed instead of a citizen, so part of a structure, be transformed into um, a client of the state. So the state can 
morph slowly into a service provider, which would be the best solution for us. So once the state is a service provider, it could be in competition with other service providers, and th this could be a way out of this situation. Well, I, I think I agree with all that. I'm not so sure the Constitution has failed if you view the Constitution's purpose as to support the power of the state, right? So it's actually succeeded. Um, from our point of view, yes, it'd be nice if the government would try to do these things to make life better for us, but that's not the state's interest. That's, the, that's basically the problem. Um, so, I, I mean, that's, I think constitutions are the problem. We need to stop legitimizing the state. Um, Well, I'm, I'm also a bit Im, Im, embarrassed, you know, to, to give precise answers to that. I think any approach, again, if I understand you correctly, the acoustic is, is quite quite difficult. But um, I think, um, in general, an approach to this problem by trying to influence this existing system, um, this you, you could say the structures based on the constitution in force um, is, as I said before, always symptom treatment. And I think um, the idea to influence, to, to try to influence this monopolist to a better behavior is, is um, a waste of time in a way. Um, you, you should keep in mind that th this is not a serious state that's a, a that's a gang that's a criminal gang you know that's a that's institutionalized unlawfulness this is the state um, you, you you can you can define it precisely i mean what, what he declares in his statutes as illegal he commits the whole day from morning to night so um, so he is he is a gangster a gangster organization and so try to influence a gangster to be more, you know, client-oriented. That, that's, that's pretty difficult. Um, and maybe there are examples other to compare it. You mentioned already uh, Liechtenstein, or somebody mentioned the, uh, the, um, the, the Constitution of Liechtenstein. Did you mention it? Um, no, that, that was somebody else. Um, that there, uh, the... Um, the the, the, the the communes the, the what's the word the Gemeinden uh, the communities the, the part uh, that they have the right to to secede ah yes uh, Jeff Dice mentioned it I think yesterday um, now I think in that case there is not a gangster um, at the top so this is somebody according to to his book the the state in the third um, millennium, where, where he said the state should be a service provider who should try to have happy clients and uh, if, they, if they are not happy they will leave or if the price is too high for this service they, they will leave. Um, but this is a very untypical um, holder of this position. So if you find some of this kind, then it's fine, and, and they um, not, not per accident uh, have this uh, regime, but I think all these conventional structures, um, I, I just don't see it in a realistic way. Uh, but was, that, was that your point? I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, uh, I want to emphasize again what uh, David Dur just said about uh, we have to be, uh, in what we say, we do have to be radical. That is of utmost importance. Um, it is clear that we don't get what we really want and we are happy for any reduction of government functions, whatever we can get. Um, and one way of being radical is, of course, also m making uh, state institutions and representatives of the state into, um, into a laughing stock. Um, and to show how utterly ridiculous it is 
that a guy like Biden or whatever his name is orders 300 million people to adhere to, yeah, uh, to certain rules that he comes up with with a bunch of maybe a hundred advisors or something like that. How dare you, who has no idea about local circumstances, about individual circumstances, order 300 million people to do this or not to do this? How ridiculous is it that if woman like Merkel can order 80 million people to do this or not to do this? The, the, these people are obviously megalomaniacs. Um, and you, you, you can um, ap apply that to, um, uh, to other things, of course, uh, as well, like gl global climate. How can you know what the correct global climate is for all of mankind? F first of all, the megalomania of people who think that people who cannot build an airport have never run a kiosk, that they can um, have the knowledge to control the climate. I mean, I, I can, I can, can uh, clean my garden, my house, and things like this is all under my control. But the, the, the anybody can believe they can uh, they can change the global global climate. Um, they, they should be they should be asked how they explain, for instance, th that the last ice age ended when there was no plane around, no no car driving around. Um, how big can the the part of humanity be to influence the the climate if these types of events happened? And again. Look, even if we could, the idea of one, uh, one temperature is the right temperature for the entire world. What a ridiculous idea. People in Greenland would like to have it warmer. People in the Maldives m might want to have it a little bit cooler. Um, I cannot even agree with my wife how cool and how, uh, 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 how warm it should be in the bedroom. I like it cooler, she likes it warmer. Uh, the, the idea that there is one global temperature that is right, this, I mean, that, that would have to be left out of, uh, out of the hall. This, and in general, all of these, these people are, are by and large stupid people. Those are all people who have never accomplished anything in their life. There's not a single individual in, in the political class that you would admire for some achievements that he has done outside of being some sort of dictator. So laughing. Uh, and also laughing at people who present us with these types of ideas, that, that seems to be the best way to, to proceed as far as I'm concerned and show in a way your radicalism in, in the most persuasive uh, way.